Alrighty, well, just by a show of hands this morning, uh, how many of you absolutely love to do laundry? Like if laundry were a full-time job, you would, you would take it. All right. Uh, how many of you are just the opposite? Like you dread doing laundry. It's one of the worst chores that you have to do. All right. How about this one? Uh, how many of you are the person that's always stuck doing the laundry in your household? You really wish that somebody else would help you do the laundry from time to time. Husbands, take notes, right? You know, laundry is not a, a, a terribly difficult chore to do, but it does involve a lot of time, and it does have quite a few steps, right? For example, you got to sort the laundry out into different piles. A couple people at the beginning service, they said, uh, yeah, we, we don't do that. We just throw it in the washer. But some of you, right, you have to sort it into files, and, and then you take a load, and you put it into the washer, and it runs for about 30 minutes, and then you got to take it out and put it in the dryer, make sure to check that lint filter, right? And then you let it go for about 60 minutes, and you go to take it out. It's still a little damp, so you let it run another 30 minutes, right? And then you, you take it out, you, you fold it or you hang it up, and then you got to put it in the closet or you put it in the drawer. And remember, that's just one load of laundry, right? If you've got multiple people in your family, especially if you have kids who go through clothes like, like madness, you're talking about four or five or six or seven loads of laundry. And you know, after a while, that can be hard to kind of keep up with. And sometimes you and I, we forget about laundry or we get sidetracked with something else, and all of a sudden, it's like our laundry routine is put on hold. For example, have you ever taken a load of laundry before? You put it in the washer, and you started it, and then like a day later, you came back, and you opened it up, and you're like, uh-oh, I let that sit. Had sort of a mildew smell, right? You know what I'm talking about? Or how about this? Have you ever gotten uh, laundry out of the, the dryer before, and you put it down on the couch, or you put it down on the table, you said, hey, I'll get to this in just a few minutes, but then a couple hours go by, a couple days go by, it's still sitting there on the couch, right? And just by a show of hands, anybody have a load of laundry that's currently sitting on their couch right now? <coughs> we do. <laughs> Two loads. Or how about this one? Uh, have you ever folded laundry before? Like you were folding it on the couch or folding it on a, a table? And, and you meant to put it in the closet, you meant to put it in the way the drawer said, I don't have time for that. And then for the rest of the week, you came out every morning and you picked out your clothes based on the piles that were on the couch, right? Now, friends, the reason I'm talking about laundry this morning uh, is because, quite frankly, I forgot to prepare a sermon for this morning. <laughs> so I'm just trying to eat up some time. No, in actuality, the, the reason why I'm talking about laundry is because laundry is something that is always going to be in your life. In other words, so long as you continue to wear clothes, which I hope that you will, laundry will continue to be a part of your life every single day. Now, here's why I share that this morning, uh, and this is where it gets to this idea that pointing it out is because it's indicative of this larger issue. Take a look that there's always something that needs to be done in our world. In other words, every single day, you and I, we have all these, these tasks and these chores and these items that need to be taken care of, and it's up to us to, to make sure that all of those things get done. For example, we have houses to clean, we have yards to take care of, we have home improvement projects to complete, we have uh, all sorts of groceries to get, we have meals to make. We have lunches to pack, we have toys to clean up, we have diapers to change, we have appointments to go to, we have errands to run, we have prescriptions to pick up. Man, we, we've got books to read and things to study for, we've got cars to refuel, we've got to get our tires rotated and our oil changed and our brake pads replaced, we've got to get things like renew our driver's license and our vehicle registration and our homeowner's insurance. We've got to pay our utility bill and our electric bill, our, our water bill, our internet bill, our cable bill with the Hallmark Channel movie package, right? We got, we, we got plans to make. We got people to see. We got parties to go to. We got phone calls to return. We got texts to get back to. We got emails to respond to. And we got four, five, six, or seven loads of laundry. And friends, we're just getting started, right? I mean, if you think about it, every single person here today, we have this never-ending to-do list of all these things. Why? Because there's always something that has to be done. Now, friends, here's why this is an issue for you and I today, because you and I, we find ourselves in this never-ending cycle where we're always working, 
and always on and always going. We're like the Energizer Bunny beating the drum every time we complete a task. But you know what? Just like Energizer batteries, eventually we start to wear out. We start to get weary and tired. We get a little grumpy, right? Irritable, frustrated, angry, upset. We start to be tired and faint and weary, all these sorts of things. And in the back of our minds, we know we should slow down. We know we should call a time out. We, we, we know we should make time to take a break. But for some reason, it's like we can't. Because we keep coming back to this reality that there's always something to be done. You see, this morning we are finishing up our series that we've been calling Built to Last Lessons from the Life of King Solomon, and every week as we've been going through this story, we've been picking up a lesson that will help you and I to live a life that is built to last. In other words, if you want to be a better friend, a better family member, a better person, ultimately a better follower of Jesus, these five things will help you build a life built to last. Now, in, in weeks one and two, just as a quick recap, we talked about how King Solomon became the king. Remember, it was kind of a rocky road. He had to make some tough decisions with his half-brother Adonijah. And then in week three, we talked about how God had given him the gift of wisdom and how he was able to use that gift for the benefit of others. Remember the story of the, the two women and the child? And then last week, Pastor Paul talked about how people came from all over the world to hear the, ri the wise words of King Solomon. Now, today, we're going to finish up this series. We're going to fast forward toward the end of King Solomon's life. He's much older now. He's been king for decades. And one day he sits down and he writes this book that today you and I call the book of Ecclesiastes. And as he's sitting there writing this book, he begins to wrestle with this very notion that there's always something that needs to be done. And friends, take a look at the, the question here that he poses to, to this reality. Take a look. He says, what do people get? For all the toil and anxious striving which, which they labor under the sun. All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at nine, my, night, their minds do not what? Do not rest. Friends, what is King Solomon saying here? He's saying, hey guys, well, what's the point of all this working and working and working and doing and doing and doing and going and going and going? I mean, why are we slaving away under the sun every single day doing this and that and this and that? Because you know what? When I look back on my life as king of Israel, all this going and going and going, it's brought me anxiety. It's brought me pain. It's brought me grief. At night, I can't even sleep because there are all these things going on in my mind. I mean, come on. What's the benefit of doing all of these things? You know, I remember one day during my junior year of college, I was sitting in my dorm room on the floor. I had these books and papers and projects, all these things, and I remember sitting there and just feeling frustrated, but not like a normal level or an acceptable level of frustration, right? This was a level of frustration that I had never really experienced before, and as I sat there looking at all of these things that I needed to accomplish, I thought, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I'm sick of the studying. I'm sick of the, the papers. I'm sick of my job. I'm sick of the clubs and organizations. I'm sick of all the social things that I have to go to. I'm sick of it all. I just want to go to sleep and wake up when the semester is over. Now, friends, in the months leading up to that moment, I had started to see myself changed, even though I didn't want to admit it. For example, I, I started to be irritable around my friends. I was getting about four hours of sleep a night. And I, I can't even remember, I was just constantly thinking, what do I got to do, what do I got to do, what do I got to do? I gained about 15 pounds during that time. Couldn't remember the last time that I had gone to the gym. I started to have stomach issues and headaches. And, 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 and the, the things that, that used to excite me, like movies and TV shows and sporting events, like I'd go to FSU football games, I didn't even want to go to those anymore. And perhaps worst of all, in that moment, I felt incredibly alone. All this going and going and going had isolated me from all the people and things that I had enjoyed the most. I wasn't happy. I wasn't joyful. I was angry. I was upset. And now all of a sudden it was starting to seep out into every single aspect of my life. Now friends, maybe you've felt this way before in a season of your life, or maybe you've felt this multiple times. Maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling this very thing right now. 
You see, King Solomon, when he looked out at the world around him, he saw person after person being crushed by all the things that they felt they had to do. And he said, wait a second, this is not how God intended for us to live. In other words, he didn't create us to be energizer bunnies who just keep going and going and are slaves to our work or slaves to our to-do list or slaves to the expectations that our culture puts on us. I mean, come on, there's got to be a better way. And you know, as he continued to write his book of Ecclesiastes, he began to come to a conclusion on how to address this issue. Take a look at what he concluded. He said, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Say this again with me, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Now friends, the Hebrew word there for tranquility is nahat, which more generally means rest. And so what King Solomon is saying here is he's saying, hey, it's better to rest than to work yourself to death. Or to put it another way, it's better to have a moment of tranquility than a lifetime of toil and chasing after the wind. You see, King Solomon, he understood that as people, we can't just keep going and going and going. At some point, we have to, to slow down and take some time to rest. And you know what? This leads us to our fifth and final lesson for this series, which is this. Take a look. That living a life of wisdom means regularly taking time to rest from your labors. In other words, the idea is this, that if you want to live a life of wisdom, you can't just keep going and going and going. You have to be able to slow down and rest. That's how you live a life built to last. And you know, when you're thinking about that for a moment, what does that look like? Regularly taking time to rest from your labors. I want to talk about this morning three different ways that you and I can do that. That's what we're going to do for the rest of our time together this morning. Practical ways that you and I can slow down every single day and rest. And friends, if you're here this morning and, and, and you consider yourself to be a workaholic, if you're somebody that's always going and going and going, I want to encourage you with this truth this morning. God's desire is for you to rest. Or to put it another way, he wants us to take time to rest from our labors. Not just on the weekend, not just on vacation, not just on Labor Day, but every single day, God's desire for you is to rest. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to take time every single day to rest, and we're going to take a look at three different ways that we can make rest a part of our routine, okay? Here's the first one this morning. We need to make time for physical rest. In other words, we need to give our bodies an opportunity to recover from all the things that we're doing. Friends, let me ask you this. Have you ever woken up one day, and you were just going and going and going, and all of a sudden you fell asleep really early? like earlier than you normally would, and then you woke up really late. Like much later than you normally would, you woke up, you were a little bit disoriented, like, whoa, what time is it? Where am I? What day is it, right? Now, sometimes that was because you were sick, but other times it was because your body forced you to shut down. Like it literally put the sorry we're close sign up and shut you down. Why? Because you weren't getting the physical rest that you needed. Now, friends, let me ask you this morning, when God created the heavens and the earth, what was the very first thing that he did after he was done creating? He rested, right? Now, here's the follow-up question. Did God need to rest? In other words, was he so tired and exhausted from all the creating of the heavens and the earth that he had to sit down and physically rest? No, right? God doesn't need to rest. So the ultimate question is, well, why exactly did he rest? And friends, the answer is that God knew that we are like this. In other words, he, he gave us an example that we are to take time to rest just like he took time to rest. You see, God is, is very well aware that you and I are in this endless circle of there's always something that needs to be done. And so knowing this, knowing that we're prone to just keep going and going and going, you remember what God did? He made rest a commandment. In other words, he said, hey, if you're not going to slow down and rest, I'm going to make you rest because you need to give your body a chance to recover. And so, friends, I want to encourage you this morning to take some time every week and make time for physical rest, not just sleep at night, but consistent physical rest throughout your day. For example, do not feel guilty about taking a nap. 
Or do not feel guilty about sitting down for a few minutes. Don't feel guilty about lying on the couch. Don't feel guilty about falling asleep during the sermon. If your body is telling you to sleep, if you're tired, listen to your body. You know, I think that's one of the things about physical rest that we often forget. We just need to slow down and rest. And friends, you know what? As you and I get older, our bodies, we need more and more time to rest. For example, when I look at our daughters running around every day, I'm like, man, where do they get all that energy? I wish I had that amount of energy. But you know what? The reality is I don't. I'm older. I'm getting to this point where I'm not able to to rest like I need to. I need more time to rest. Maybe you two have gotten to this moment in your life before where you've had these realizations like, man, I can't bike 25 miles a day like I used to. Or I can't pop out of bed and get out of the door like I used to. Or I can't do things around the house like I used to. Or I can't eat red lobster cheddar biscuits like I used to, right? You see, friends, God's desire is for you and I to rest, and that means making time for physical rest. And friends, I want to encourage you and challenge you. Some of you here this morning, you're saying, hey, Chris, that's a nice idea, but I'm just in a season of my life where I'm just going and going and going. Like, it's just not possible. Here's my challenge for you. If you're in a busy season of your life right now, schedule an appointment with yourself to rest. For example, schedule an appointment with your favorite chair or schedule an appointment with your couch. Schedule an appointment with your bed. If you're a night owl like me, schedule your bedtime a half an hour earlier than you normally would. The idea is this, that if you can keep your doctor appointments, if you can keep your work appointments, if you can keep your social appointments, then you can also keep your rest appointments. Okay, however you decide to do it, I want to encourage you, whether you you schedule it in your physical calendar, your online calendar, or just in your head, make some time every single day for consistent physical rest beyond sleep. Now, here's the second one this morning, is to make time for mental rest. In other words, give your mind a chance to recover from all the things that you're thinking about. You remember when when Jesus would go around, he would meet with all these large crowds. You remember sometimes what he would do? He'd slip away. In other words, he'd take a mental break. He'd go away and be by himself with his thoughts. And you know, the same is true for you and I today. Sometimes when life is crazy and we're stressed out about all sorts of things, we need to be able to step away and take a mental break. For example, you remember what the Golden Girls would do when they, they couldn't sleep at night? They had all these things on their mind. They would go into the kitchen. They'd sit down at the kitchen table. What would they eat? Cheesecake, right? Friends, we need more cheesecake in our lives. In other words, we need more moments where we can mentally step away from whatever it is that we're thinking about and do something else that gives our mind time to rest. For example, whenever you're stressed about something or you're worried about something, you're frustrated about something, take a moment, go outside and go for a walk. Or go to the gym. Or go to the grocery store. If you have a a partner, go on a date. If you have a family, go on a family date. Read a book. Or maybe maybe, maybe read something. Or or, or maybe do an art project. Take some time. It, It might just be doing the laundry or doing the dishes, right? Whatever it is, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever you decide to do, you need to be able to step away mentally and then come back to it refreshed. And friends, if I could just speak to this for a moment, uh, these things right here, these things are not designed for mental rest, right? In fact, their, their goal is to keep you on as long as they can. For example, when's the last time you were scrolling through Facebook and you reached the end of your feed? Like it said, this is the end of your feed. We got nothing more for you. You know, when it first started, Facebook, they actually did that. You reach the end of your feed. I challenge you today, please don't do this, but I challenge you, (laughs) keep scrolling. They're going to keep finding content for you to read all day long. Or how about this? You ever been watching reels on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, and all of a sudden you just ran out of reels to watch? They said, oops, we're sorry. We have no more reels to show you today. No, their goal is to keep you on as long as they can. And friends, here's why this is an issue. That means that this is not mental rest. It's mental distraction, but it's not mental rest because our phones are designed to keep our minds going and going and going and going. 
Now, the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes when you and I need a mental break, for the super majority of us, this is the first thing we turn to. In fact, did you know that the average adult spends six hours and 43 minutes a day staring at screens? If you add that up in terms of your life, that's 7,956 days. Or how about this? That's almost 22 years of your life. Think about that. 22 years of your life staring at screens. You know what a lot of therapists and counselors are prescribing to people with mental health issues today? They're telling them to put this down and go outside and experience the physical world around them. You see, friends, I want to encourage you this morning, every single one of us, just like our bodies can't keep going and going and going, our minds also can't keep going and going and going. We have to make time for mental rest. And then finally this morning, the third one is to make time for spiritual rest. In other words, give your soul the chance to recover from all the things that you're doing and thinking about. You know, sometimes the reason why we're physically exhausted and mentally exhausted is because we're spiritually empty. For example, we we, we find ourselves not having read God's word for a long period of time, or we're we're not praying regularly, we're not getting together with other believers and, and studying God's word, and it's not like we meant to do that. It's not like we meant to disconnect ourselves from God. I think every single one of us here today, we want to stay connected to God. So what happened? Well, we fell into that never-ending cycle that there's always something to do. You remember these words from Jesus in Matthew chapter 11? Take a look at this. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. Friends, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, guys, at any time, anywhere, for any reason, you can come to me, and you can experience my rest. You see, the good news of the gospel is that you and I have a Savior in Jesus Christ who worked so that we could rest. In other words, the the work that matters, the labor that endures to eternal life, Jesus has already accomplished that with his death and resurrection. Amen? And friends, therefore, you and I, we can come into this world where we have the freedom in Christ to slow down and rest because the work that matters has already been accomplished. And friends, if I could just say a few things about church for a moment here, I I pray that every Sunday when you come to worship, I pray that this service is a time of spiritual rest for you, that you can experience the presence of God and receive his forgiveness and his grace and his love, and you can receive in the Lord's Supper his very self. I pray that when you come here on Sunday mornings that you are encouraged, that you are challenged, that you are built up, that you are affirmed. In other words, I pray that when you come to church on Sundays, I pray that it's like a spiritual siesta where you can leave here and you can go back out into the world and you can feel refreshed and rejuvenated in the spiritual rest that God the Father gives to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, what King Solomon came to understand is ultimately what Jesus came to proclaim. That as people, you and I, we need to make time to rest. And so I know tomorrow's Labor Day. I know it's Labor Day weekend. But I hope you just won't rest tomorrow. I hope you just won't rest this weekend. I pray that you will rest every single day. That is God's desire for you. That is his design for you. It's okay to rest. And friends, one more thing. If I could speak to the parents and the grandparents and the caretakers of of older folks, family members, it is sometimes hard to give yourself permission to rest. Because you're constantly having to take care of somebody else. And sometimes you feel guilty. You feel like, I I shouldn't take this moment. I I shouldn't be lying on the couch. I shouldn't be doing this. But friends, every single one of us, we need to take time to rest. There's no guilt or shame in taking a moment, stepping away, and having a moment for yourself. And so friends, whatever your season of life, I want to encourage you this morning, take some time every single day for physical rest, for mental rest, and for spiritual rest. Because you know what? The laundry, it can wait. To Jesus be all the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen? Amen. Please join me in prayer. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we give thanks that when you created us, you created us to be people who accomplish things. 
who take on the world around us, who help people, who work, who, who think about all the things and the problems that we see in this world. And sometimes we just keep going and going and going and we forget that we need to slow down and rest. Lord, we give thanks today that you made rest a commandment in your word, that you call on us to take time to rest, whether that's a day, whether that's multiple times a day. We ask this morning that you would help us to take time for physical rest, to let our bodies recover. We ask that you would help us to make time for mental rest, that you would allow our minds to recover. And Lord, we also ask this morning that you would help us to make time for spiritual rest, that we can allow our souls to recover and find that rest in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning in our own lives, as we evaluate the rest that we are seeing, maybe we're looking at our lives right now and thinking, man, I, I'm not resting like I should. Or maybe there's somebody in our lives that we're thinking about, man, I just see that person going and going and going. I need to reach out and encourage them to rest. Whatever it may be, whenever we see somebody going and going and going, may we remind them and encourage them to take that time for physical, mental, and spiritual rest. Lord, we are so thankful this morning that whenever we come together, we can rest in you. We can experience your goodness and grace. And this morning, we lift these prayers up to you by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we hope you'll join us next week. We're going to start a new series that we're calling Consistency versus Chaos. And the whole idea is this, that when God created the earth, he created an earth of consistency. We came into the mix and provided the chaos. But you know what? The other part of that is that oftentimes when we live our lives, we live our lives filled with chaos, and that's not how God intended our lives to be. He wants us to live lives of consistency. And so throughout this series, we're going to look at all sorts of different avenues, our bodies, parenting, everything. We hope you'll join us over these next four weeks because we're going to take a look at what it looks like to live a consistent life for God in these different areas in your life, how we can avoid the chaos in the process. If you're with us this morning for the first time or you're visiting, we'd like to, to welcome you here to Our Savior. If you want to reach out to somebody here and say hello, of course, you can always come see me. I'll be out here in the outside uh, welcoming you, and uh, we'd love to hear about your worship experience. Uh, if you'd like to give this morning to the Our Savior ministry, we appreciate all the tithes and offerings that comes in. That's how we are primarily funded here at Our Savior. Uh, if you're here in the sanctuary this morning, there is an offering bowl on the way out. Or if you're here in the sanctuary, you're worshiping with us online you can always give at OurSaviorFL.org. You can text to give, and we are also on Venmo. Let's go ahead and stand as we continue our worship together this morning, resting in the love that Jesus has for us this morning. <laughs> 